Right. What up, what up? We're gonna get started here in just a couple of seconds. I'm gonna load it up on this so I can also see, make sure my camera's working the whole time. Work this out. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's see here. Turn it down. All right. Should be able to see your comments this way. There it is. Nice. Uh, yeah. So I know the flyer, uh, I should start off Hawaii, Jaje Weekday, Marcus. Hello, my name is Marcus Osage, Potawatomi, Delaware, Puerto Rican on my dad's side. I know the flyer originally had um, me and Pearl Yellowman. We're gonna chit chat for a little bit. Um, and we were gonna discuss, man, she has some amazing content and research. Actually, I'm sorry, Dr. Pearl Yellman. Uh, she was going to, uh, you know, breaks down on some of her research finding. And what we're gonna do is, you know, she has a very prestigious job work, working with the president of Navajo Nation. And so uh, they, they had some stuff come up today and we wanted to make sure we had time to, to fully unpack that in such a cool way. So we're gonna revisit that. Instead, because of Valentine's Day, right? Uh, we're in February and hearts start coming out. And every time you go to the store, you see little bears and chocolates and all of that. We were like, hold on a second, let's uh, let's 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 revisit the the poverty part into uh, and how that messes with us in a uh, for a later date. So that that will be uh, that will be for a later date. And so today we're just gonna chit chat on some. And so feel free. Uh, in the comments, um, of course, I've, I've shared this, you know, in various communities, I've shared a little bit about this before on here, something very special, important to my heart, because at the end of the day, for me, and oh, and also like, you know, just recently, I think it was yesterday, the day before, I saw some great content on here about toxic masculinity, and and I just know that that some of, a lot of the work that Native Wellness Institute does, uh, it, it relationships is like the intersection for it all if you think about it that's why it's important to me that's of course the way i see it but uh that's why it's important to me is that it, more important than any of the accolades or you know the shows or djing you know I, uh, for those who don't know i dj and i work with nike n7 I work with taboo sometimes in the black eyed peas um, recently started working with the thunder oklahoma city thunder and so I work in the entertainment field and I leverage my work in the entertainment field uh, to speak to the lives of young people and leadership organizations across the country. And so I built a company called One Entertainment, I-N-N-E-R, Entertainment. So it's the entertainment with the inner in mind. And so uh, what I was saying that for, it wasn't just like a plug or a shout out, but it was to say that all those accolades and all those cool, you know, getting the DJ for you know, the Thunder, or getting to go at a cool tour with Taboo overseas, or, you know, like getting to go to the VMAs, those accolades are fun and nice and cool. But more important than any of those are healthy relationships. You know, one of the things that we tell young people when we're in classrooms with them or conferences with them is that one thing that I, I, I stress is that in any country right now, you know, when we look at some of the things that need to happen in our leadership structures and for our youth is uh, I always tell them, I say, you know, we, we don't need any DJs. They're always like, man, I seem hypocritical, man, you're a DJ and all that. Uh, I was like, no, we don't need them. But if you become one, I'll buy your mixtape. We don't need sports stars. 
But if you become one, I'll buy a jersey and come to your show. We don't need famous rappers or singers, but if you become one, I'll buy your album and go to your show. Um, but it, but is it, is it necessary? Do we need them? Need them, right? What we need are healthy families. That's what we need, right? And there are a lot of them out there, and and there are many of us that have came from some very dysfunctional upbringing, <clears throat> Merck and. Uh, statistical certainty of doom and gloom and have then transcended and came into a place of not perfect, but healthy. And I think that's the goal for a lot of us is to be able to, to that's what the toxic, you know, toxicity can, can work male or female in those toxic relationships. And so the counterbalance to that are healed and healthy relationships. And so that's what I like to, I, I, that's like, that's, it's like my soapbox, if you will, it's my, uh, so what I love is seeing the light bulbs click. You know, it's cool when you when you do a dope rhyme and they go, whoa, or you do a dope thing on the turntables and they go, wow. But I love it when the light bulb flickers and they start thinking about who they're dating, who they're attracting, right? And so I have a, I have a, a a little overarching philosophy with a lot of what I do. And that's what you step towards, you attract. What you, st what you step towards, you attract. What you attract follows you around and creates miraculous opportunities for more of the thing that you're stepping towards. So I stepped towards entertainment, I attracted entertainment. I stepped towards leadership, I attract leadership. If I step towards drama and I step towards toxicity, I'm gonna attract toxic drama in my life. And I'm, I'm gonna pull that to myself if that's the direction I'm stepping. Now, a lot of us will step in certain directions unconscious because we're not aware of our steps. So one of the first levels is uh, self-awareness. And when self-awareness hits, you can be aware of your steps. What I love about working with Nike and Seven is they see, you know, they say that your steps matter for seven generations. Dang, that's the crazy thing about that. Not only what you step towards, you attract, but your steps have implications beyond yourself. That the way you step matter for the generations to follow. Now, how do you create generations and create generations through families and whatnot? Now, uh, I wanna share my screen a little bit just to get us all on the same page. Let me see if I have uh, anybody here that needs Gotcha, okay, just in case. I don't wanna leave anybody out over here. Uh, share my screen. You need to get to the core problem of dysfunctional families caused by assimilation. Yeah, I mean, so generational historical trauma, right? And I mean, there's a lot of different layers and, and parts of that that contribute to a word that we like to say just trauma right because trauma for assimilation trauma for uh, racism trauma from abuse trauma from the the universal through line is trauma and then the answer for trauma is healing and the battle is going to be that journey right of getting from from the trauma to the healing and so to be on the same page Let's see if I do this right. You have to bear with me a little bit. I'm usually a, a tech wizard in the, in the natural, but here on Zoom, I kind of struggle a little bit. So I'm still learning. Let me see here. I think this is what I'm looking for. Oh, let me guess. It's going gonna, it's gonna to mess with me now. Uh, let's go here. A little bit about, you know, my background was uh, my mom got pregnant at 13. She was 13 years old. She had me uh, 14. I came out. I mean, 14 was when I when she had me 13 because she's pregnant. And uh, my grandma, I don't know if you guys can see that slide. Let me see. Yep, you can. I had, had my uh, mom when my, my grandma was only 15. She had two kids by 15 already. My mom was declared unfit to raise me. And the reason I talk about them having kids so early is I just talk about 
the pattern that that presented. My mom ended up un unfit to raise me. California deemed her, uh, her heroin addiction and I mean, she was a baby, you know, right? So it's, it's uh, some people see what I do and they think, oh, okay, those kind of guys live a certain kind of way. But at the end of the day, some of us have backstory that's real similar, ha have something in common, which is trauma. And at some point we have to face overcoming feeling helpless or hopeless, whether it's, uh, you know, something that's happened to you, some, some consequence of things we've done or said, that's something universal to us all. And, and I like to call that word trauma. Now overcoming that to get us on the same page is this right here has helped frame, not my success, but frame like my steps. There we go. It's helped frame my steps. And you, you've been around me a lot or even a little, you've probably seen or heard this, but just in case you're new to me or new to you know what I'm sharing, I like this as a, as a, as a jumping off point. Cause like, like uh, they shared in there about the assimilation and the, the trauma. Uh, and we, as, as we go to unpack all those different levels of trauma and historical uh, intergenerational trauma that we've, we've gone through, we also have access to intergenerational wisdom and this has helped me navigate those steps. And, and it's, it's basically, if you're watching this, I want you to do me a favor, wherever you're at, I know you might be on your phone scrolling or you're, you're on your computer watching this because you were looking forward to checking in with Native Wellness Institute Power Hour, sponsored by Noise, by the way, put that out there. Thank you guys for allowing us. Um, Wherever you are, maybe you're watching this later on a rebroadcast. You're, you're one of those that's not watching current live, but you're, you're watching it later. So now it's live for you. Wherever you're at, I want you to do a favor. It might look silly, but just do it for me. I want you to put one hand on your head. I mean, you're probably by yourself. So what? you might as well just do it. Put one hand on your head, wherever you're at. Say, I have. Say, I have a belief system. What the heck? is a belief system. I'm glad you asked me that. Now, your belief systems, your, your how we believe, our, our inner core belief system, though it's kind of like a computer bank vault all at the same time. It stores, but also processes everything that you think is right and wrong. Everything you think is good and bad, cool and uncool, is stored and processed in your belief systems. Those turn into something. Your beliefs turn into and give you your feelings. Now we talk about catching those, especially Valentine's Day and especially with hearts and candy. And we talk about all this stuff, you know, about romance and, and relationship building. Oh man, out there catching feelings, right? Well, feelings come from beliefs. You have beliefs first, those turn into feelings. Feelings turn into actions, actions over time shape and mold and become our habits. Our habits over time shape and mold our personality. Our personalities over time will ultimately lead us to our destiny, right? Our destiny in life. Now a lot of people, for a lot of people that's kind of a big word, destiny. Usually when I hear it, it's like, it is your destiny. Whoa. that's that's big, you know, I, I don't know how to like use that in middle school or high school. That word is kind of like, you know, like, okay, I know. I always joke around and say, I know a couple of girls named destiny, but how to use that word in my everyday life, your destiny, I have to switch that word up and make that word destination points. So your destination points in life are linked to the beliefs you hold for good or for bad or for, for wrong or for right what you believe ends up determining your destiny or your destination points, which for me is easier to, to think of it in those terms. It's easier for me to think of it in terms of destination point because I can see those clear. So what I like to ask, you know, uh, when I'm standing in, in a conference center or a community or, or school, I like to ask the young people, what are some positive destination points in life? And They'll give me graduation. They'll say, you know, a job, a career. Um, some places have said a home with the heater working. 
uh, some places, you know, that there's all these different lists that will go on and say, they'll say, you know, a happy family, wow, positive destination points in life, right? Uh, well, I say, what are some negative destination points in life? They'll list jail, addiction, um, unhealthy relationships, they'll list those, toxic, they'll call them toxic relationships. Those, uh, they're so hard to, to navigate. And I ask them, what's crazy is, nobody ever starts their day off planning for the second list. No one ever thinks to themselves, man, if I really play my cards right, I could end up rugged, a hey, rugged. Anyway, nah, but like, I'm serious. Like no one plans, no one shoots for rugged as the, as the goal. No one shoots for ratchet as like, man, someday, hopefully if I play my cards right, I can be in a relationship someday that'll be so jealous that I won't be able to wear anything I want. Man, it's gonna be so oppressive someday. I, that's what I'm looking forward to is someday I'll have 37 missed calls. Um, they'll follow me everywhere. I'll feel under pressure all the time. Who think who, who shoots for that? No one shoots for that. We shoot for the positive list, but some end up in that other list. And so why, how, what is that, that detours people almost unconsciously? It's because sometimes unconsciously what's in our belief system right? So the, where you're going to have your destination points in life is determined by the beliefs that you hold now. That's your rights and wrongs. Who gave those to you? Let me look in here. Who gave those to you real quick? I'm going to put that out there to you. Who gave you your rights and wrongs in life? Let me see here. Who gave those to you? When we ask these young people this question, we sometimes get, uh, that their parents give it to them, that they get their rights and wrongs from their parents. Some people will say that they get it from their school. Some will say they get their rights and wrongs from law enforcement or the government. Some parents, there we go, I see that one. I see you, Deborah, with parents. You know, and, and parents for me is important because, you know, now that I, that I am a parent, you know, it holds a little different weight than it did when I was just a child. You know, I see that office as some as an office to hold. And I see that office when you see it as an office to hold, you respect it differently. Right. It's all it's all perception and how we see it. And that's goes into you know, the formation of our belief systems, how you see these different terminologies that we use. We use words like parents, well, okay, or destiny, okay. But like, when you think about destiny as destination points, okay, I might help you navigate. When you think about parent, the parent role as, as an office to hold, it changes its perspective a little bit. Uh, and here's what's, what's really cool, and I wanna say this, it opens up opens it up to, to to all people in the sense that the parental role so we did a huge it's called parents speak up campaign back in the day through hhs and it was getting parents to speak into the lives of their their young people um about sexual activity at an early age whatever so but the key in that was one of the one of the the facts that in the, that came out of those stats was that the number one influence in the lives of teenagers, who would you think it is? I know that I thought it was Snoop Dogg. I thought it was Two Chains or, or uh, uh, whoever the young latest rapper is or the young latest DJ or the, the hottest kid on the show or whatever, right? I thought that's who the number one influence would have been. But turns out the number one influence of teenagers is the person playing the parental role. And the reason we say it like that is because they also found that there was a general market campaign, Latino, Hispanic, African-American, and Native American. In the Native American uh, bracket, if you will, they found that the parental structure wasn't just mom, dad, that who played the role of mom and dad was diversified across family lines. 
that you had other people and it was it varied from tribe to tribe was saying it was like like that for every single body but <clears throat> but still our parental structure wasn't just mom dad kid right it was there were a lot of different uh there it was spread apart so we call it the parental role and the parental role is played by various people across a child's life so that's why i stopped real quick on that for a second to give it the, its honor that as an office to hold it's a it's a kind of a prestigious office to hold in the life of, of a young person when you're helping to play that parental role in their life so where else do they get their uh, yeah peers that's a good one angela that's a good one peers is now peers is like a dr phil term for you know friends homies peeps whatever they call them these days but uh that's all where they get their belief systems from right where they get their rights and where we get our rights and wrongs from where do we get those from we also get them from uh, a big one out there is our is ourself we get them from from trial and error well, it's cool seeing the young person's light bulb start to flicker when they think about oh yeah i play a part in this like i'm testing life i'm testing these belief systems and seeing what i believe and what works and what doesn't work so you play an integral part in that um there's a there's the list is almost endless in life of these different uh places where we get and form our rights and wrongs. But of the little list that we just created here, including ourselves and teachers and parents and schools and governments and, and uh, our environment, if you will, whatever, is there anything in that list that's perfect? Is there anything where we get our rights and in life, I'm not talking about deity, I put deity in a separate category of perfection, but creator, but outside of that on earth where we get our rights and wrongs from is there any source that's perfect if there's a source that is there in other words all of the sources that determine our rights and wrongs come from sources that can have false information in them can parents be false yeah they might not mean to is the media can the media be false yeah right can teachers teach a wrong thing sure you know, again, it might not be intentional, but we can get false information into our belief system from these places that we get our rights and wrongs from. As we grow and as we're learning and as we're, like I said, as we're growing, we're getting this information into our belief system. And it comes from sources that that can have false information in them. It might not be intentional, but they could still have it in them. And what I like to show them, you know, the students and I'll share with you today is that when something is false, it's called a lie. And so we get lie in our belief system. We get shrapnel of false information trapped in our belief system, right? We get these little bits of lie. We get these little, little bits of false information stuck in there. And if I get that information stuck in there, if I believe, like I, I get a lie told to me when I'm little, you good for nothing, you'll be just like your dad. Well, dang. Well, when you find him, tell him where I'm at. Hey, that's what I had to say, because I didn't know him yet growing up. Eventually, I got to know him, finally got to meet him, had a great relationship with him. Um, but if I believe that, that lie, good for nothing, good for nothing, good for nothing, how am I going to feel? right here my feelings going to be positive or negative you know what i mean so they're going to more likely be negative and then my actions over time how, how are they going to be if i believe that lie and that lie festers it's going to affect my feelings in a negative way and then how's it going to affect my actions in a negative way habits are going to become negative personality and i end up in those negative destination points all because i believed a lie and so that's what I'm big on is trying to not tell people what to think, but instead show how we think so that we can be self-aware and crunch the numbers for ourselves and see, okay, hold on a second. Did I, why do I think that? Was I told to think that? Was I conditioned to think that? Was I, well, have I been, have I been misled to think that? Like did that shrapnel of false information get down into my belief system that now I believe a certain thing, that I believe that I'm not worthy of a good relationship, 
that I believe that I'm not qualified to have the best, to be treated great, not just to be treated okay, but do I believe that I'm worth being treated great? Like, just on its basic level, do you struggle with that belief? And that becomes our homework assignment as we begin to unpack those lies of where do we get the information we got and what secret lies are we holding on to about ourselves? Because that's what that's the internal work that has to happen so that then I can become a healthier person to then approach the door of a relationship. So when we talk about relationships, when we talk about Let me see here. I want you guys to say this with me. In to me see. Now say it real fast. Intimacy. When we talk about relationships, we're talking about um, we're talking about a situation where intimacy is going to be in play now i know that's not a term if you're a young person watching this right now that's not a term we use walking around going yo what's up man i'm just chilling in my intimacy you know i know it's not a term that we use on the daily but i love the way this illuminates to me what intimacy really looks like it's into me see you know i create like i said created one entertainment entertainment with the inner in mind this goes along with that as far as the inner qualities and the inner vulnerabilities. And when we start to unlock some of those lies that we've been told or shown or been oppressed on and been, and been conditioned to think we're, we're not worthy of great things, when it comes time to be vulnerable in an intimate setting, uh, we can set ourselves up for more trauma instead of more healing. And the trauma at this level could be cataclysmic in, in, in our inner self. It could be very painful because it's deep. It's, it's within. It's not an outside pain. It's not a pain that you can show somebody. And so one of the frameworks, uh, what I like to submit, this, this is a pathway that worked for me. And when I want to pre pre um, present this in a way, in a good way, by saying that, you know, I had a past, right? <clears throat> that was like snagging and like, you know, toxic culture, objectifying women, all of, all of that, that I had been trained and conditioned to see that that's what women were for. That's what a partner was for, that they were to, to just be like a thing, not a person, right? So as I, as I unpack this, of, of what helped me. I want to offer this kind of like a buffet for you out there to grab what you want, grab what you need that helps you. And if it, you know, if it, if it works for you, keep it. If it doesn't, you can throw it out. Um, this is just merely some tips and, and some helpful guides that have helped me be able to navigate from my, my mom being 13 pregnant, we go into eighth grade twice, and the dysfunctional, abusive, addictive, addict behavior coming out of that to be able to try to form a healthy relationship. Married almost 20 years, we're not perfect, but I do believe that we're on the healthier side of uh, the relational game. So, so there's some attributes that have helped us. And so that's what I'm sharing today is some of those nuggets that have helped us and maybe they'll help you. They're not being shared in a way that you have to do everything that I did. Um, because we all have our, our journeys and we all have our routes. This helped me frame intimacy. This helped me frame how I shared intimacy. And what's crazy is I've seen this. You know how you look at the sun and you close your eyes and you can still see the sun? I saw this that same way. So I had a spiritual interaction where I, I came to the end of myself and the beginning of a spiritual journey quest where I surrendered and wanted everything to go through a spiritual filter. Me personally, that's where I was at. 
I was tired of running things my own way. And I said, you know what, let me, let me start listening to spiritual people, right? Jaleen, people like that, people that have the spirit, the spirit in mind. And along the lines of that, I closed my eyes, saw this, and it really helped me with how I was sharing intimacy. The first level that we share intimacy is our words. You know, the first level is our words. When we, words are, now you'll notice right here, hopefully you can see this, this is dotted. So that means you can share your words with, this is not dotted. You can share your words with a finite amount of people or an infinite amount of people, but it doesn't change the power of your words. Your words are still powerful. Like, like uh, you know, like calling girls snags, you know, or, or demeaning, uh, objectifying them in our speech, right? But also what we say is a glimpse into us. So when you're sharing your words, your words are powerful. Words. So if I share my words with five people or I share my words here and this ends up going viral, let's say, it doesn't change the power of the words though. The amount of people that hear the word that are shared doesn't change the sacredness of the words, right? The words carry power. And uh, that's the first level we, we share with one another is our words. That's why languages are important because certain words Languages have more meaning behind them, our indigenous languages, than the English counterpart. However, with that said, the next rung up here, as we share our intimacy, we can share it with less and less people. So I share it with this next block here. It's called, you know, that cutie, right? Hey, what up, cutie? Now, it's really quality time. That's our quality time. When you share your quality time, uh, you'll notice it's not dotted. That's fixed, that's finite. You only have 24 hours every day and that's fixed. Nobody has extra ones. I remember telling one of my mentors back in the day, I used to say, sorry, man, sorry I'm late, man. I just ran out of time. And he would say, that's funny. You have the same amount of time that Einstein did. You have the same amount of time Martin Luther King did. I just go, oh, um, so you're not managing it the same. Oh, okay. All right. Give it to me. Okay. What that just shows is that we have 24 hours every day to work with and it's equal. That's what I love about, about truth and, and some of these, they're not based on feeling, they're based on like, the, there's no way to argue that. There's 24 hours in, and we all have the same amount, but, but it's fixed. So I can only share my words in a quality sense with a few people. In other words, I share this with a lot of people here in this digital world. And maybe there's 25 or 50, wow, nice, 50 people watching live and there might be 1,000 people, 2,000 people that watch it later. But I can only go to lunch and have quality time with three or four or five. We can in the comments back and forth with two or three or four or five, right? So the amount of intimacy that can be shared, the more, the higher we go, the less people we can share it with. And, uh, and that's how we share. Our, and, and, and as we share it, bonds are beginning to happen. So when you talk around with someone for a long time, these kids always like to say, these kids, these conferences, so man, they're so funny, man. Was, man, we just talking. Hey, <clears throat> we just talking. Golly, right? Get all mad. What are you talking about? What are your words? Your words are so powerful. Bonds form when you share these intimacies. It's a light bond when you're sharing your words, but when you start sharing quality time with people, you're going to build a stronger bond, friendship bond, a familial bond. You'll, get, you'll, you'll, you'll be bonded, right? The more you go up, the tighter the bond that forms. And so this, this next rung here, again, like I said, <clears throat> saw this and I was like, this is, this is weird when I was writing on my napkin. Um, I was like, breath. And you'll notice that there's not much room up here now. We're running out of space. Turns out the word breath 
and the word, in many languages, the word breath equals spirit. So that when you share the breath with somebody, how do you share the breath, right? When you're kissing around. What if you're sharing something spiritual? That was like light bulb self-awareness moment for me. <clears throat> Let me first say this. This is not a don't kiss workshop. I don't want nobody mad on the internet talking about Marcus MC1 said don't be kissing. I didn't say that, okay? But I will say this illuminated to me reality of what I was playing with. And I realized, man, I have been loose with my words. Man, I have been loose with my quality time. I have been very loose with my breath, my spiritual connection. And now the bond that was formed at the word level is one thing. With the quality level, it's another thing. But this bond, when you share this bond, now that's a bond that feels a little different when it breaks. When you separate that, if you've shared the breath with somebody and then you go to separate, you're going to feel that tug. It's different. So that's a different bond. You can't show it to anybody, but it's it's a tug. It, you're connected at a level, a uh, spiritual level. You're connected. And although you can't show it to anybody, you feel it. Now, that could be painful for, for many people when that breaks at that level. And it could be traumatic, a form of trauma or re-triggering trauma on, on a long list of trauma that was already there. Right. Again, not a don't kiss workshop, just what illuminated to me was I was sitting there as a young man, conference guy, snagging up, you know, and I realized, man, here I am sharing something maybe that sacred frivolously. It was just food, food, uh, food for thought for me. And so I thought to myself, what if I save that? What if I held on to that, right? Since just, and be more, be more guarded. Instead of being freer, the higher I go on this list. What if I was a little more guarded? Not just for me. Eventually I got to the point to where I was guarded for them because I realized that's a bond they also may have. And they may have that bond more than I do, or I may have it more than them, but but nonetheless, that bond could be there. And then, so looking out for them, maybe I need to refrain and be a little more controlled. And then as you move up this uh, intimacy sharing, you know, they say it's lonely at the top when two people, you know, when you're physically intimate and they say, uh, you know, to become, you know, you're up there. It's just lonely at the top. It's a spot made for one person. Only one person fits at that little top level, but we've all seen two people crammed in a spot that they, they go to this position too early they go to this this place this intimacy level too fast and then you have two forced into a spot that only fits one and so they're forced in there and because of that they're just so hugged up you see i know you've seen them walk around you know walk around pout walk around a basketball tournament uh, the guy's got his girl in the headlock and she's got her hand in his back pocket. Well, this was pre COVID and they're walking around and they're all, you know, just, just smashed together. Just like, Oh man, man. Right. Oh, right. You see that all the time. People smash themselves into a, into I need you. I got, Oh man. Can't live without you. You complete me Jack. Oh my gosh. And eventually somebody needs to what? Eventually, whether it's two weeks, two months, two years, somebody's going to need to breathe. They're going to need to come down here, right? Eventually, they're going to need to breathe. Eventually, they might need a little more time to themselves. And, you, and now you're going to come down the rungs of separation until we need to talk, until you don't talk anymore. And that graduation downwards is can be so painful and so traumatic that when you break the tie at the breath level, it's one thing, but when you break the tie, the bond at, at the physical level, that bond can be so tight, internal, not just external, but internal in this, in the spiritual realm, what you're sharing there is on such an inner into me, see area 
you're so vulnerable there that that when that separation happens that can be cataclysmic and we see junior highs and high schools all over our communities going through the nuclear equivalency of a divorce right and not having anything to help them with that pain because Tylenol doesn't fix that. You know, Excedrin won't help that. That's a pain and they, how do they express that? And then there's shame and, and all that that get counteracts their, uh, their journey towards the getting the healing that they need. They can't bring it up. So they got, oh no. So what do they do to medicate that? More high risk behavior, more consumption, I know my mom went to heroin, my mom went to alcohol, my mom deadened it, numbed it with outside forces, you know? And so what we, that contributes to a lot of the other stuff we see. And it could be prevented if it was balanced. So when I started this epiphany of man, spiritual walk of relationships and how to protect them instead of uh, prey on them, right? How to pray with an A, not an E. Put that somewhere. Um, I started talking to elders about, you know, some of the ways that they were married and they had relationships back in the day that were, that they were even arranged sometimes. That was crazy to me to think about that. But in all those situations, they had some of these ingredients and one of them is being able to balance your intimacy with your commitment. You gotta be able to balance your intimacy with your commitment. So that means that I'm only allowed to be as intimate to the degree I'm committed. It's inappropriate for me to ask for intimacy at a level higher than I'm committed. I'll say that again, it's inappropriate for me to ask for intimacy at a level higher than I am committed. That's just old school. So here, let me give you an example. Back in the day, you couldn't just roll up to somebody. If you saw somebody that you wanted to talk to or wanted to meet like that or track you to whatever, you couldn't just roll up to that person. You had to go to that person's family. You had to then, you know, be in the light. You had to be out in the open about it. You couldn't be sneaky. And today the technology is what it is that you know, these young people just can get to each other with no <clears throat> safeguards. We had so many cultural safeguards in place that protected this intimacy and that the intimacy could be um, enjoyed and just like safeguarded and, and be amazing and wonderful and awesome, right? It's like a fire in a fireplace, it's amazing. But a fire outside of a fireplace is dangerous to everybody involved. That's how intimacy worked. So we had cultural uh, norms to help contain a lot of that. And, and over the generations, that's what we have to get back is that, and I like to say this a lot, but I like to say we can be old school in the new school. We can have those old school value systems in the new school. And that's what I walked out with this journey that I was on, where I went from being one way to self-awareness, switching some steps, and then, then the journey forward, which is a continual journey even today. But this is what this is what helped was balancing and realizing that I'm inappropriate asking for intimacy higher than my commitment level. If I want to know her favorite song, if you want to know uh, his or her favorite pizza topping, how committed are you? So are you at least at the friend level? before you ask for who they are, or where they come from. That's what intimacy is in to them see. So that knowledge of who they are is sacred. And we have to think of it like that. Our belief system, we have to see that all these people walking around are sacred and who they are and how they got that way is sacred. And all of it, their wisdom and their trauma and their journey, it's all theirs and it's valuable. And I am no one that just gets to walk up and get it and take it and claim it. That's not, that's not our, you know, that's not a healthy foundation. So I have to at least be at the friend commitment level 
And you know what? If you are, you're probably going to know the favorite song. You're probably going to know how they like their pizza because you're their friend. And then as the commitment grows, the intimacy is allowed to go with, with consent, right? So commitment, intimacy, commitment, intimacy, until you get to the highest form of commitment, which whatever word you want to use for that, you can use that uh, partnership or whatever it is. So you can use marriage, whatever, but uh, whatever the highest form of commitment is for you, when you reach that, then the highest level of commitment, I mean, the highest level of commitment, the highest level of intimacy can be safe because you've, you're committed to the, to the highest degree. And now you'll notice that you got two people in a spot made for one. And that's, that's the, the miracle of it all is that two become one and that they're now able to coexist. And what that looks like is two people able to be there and have room enough to breathe, to have quality time together, to talk. I'll be honest, you know, so we're going on 20 years here and my, my marriage and, and my wife and I, and some of the, some of the best, you know, what I look forward to the most is our, is our shows and coffee and chit chatting. And we talk all the time. We talk all the time. And there's something to that, you know, there's a healthy, there's a healthy model in there that I never got to see. I never got to see two parental figures or two family figures have enough space between them to be able to allow for each person to keep their identity intact, but share it with the other person, which brings up all kinds of our, 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 our battle of overcoming some of the lies that are in our belief system. Because if I, if I believe on some sub level that my partner is a possession, then I'm gonna try to control them. I'm gonna try to own them and rule them. And I'm not even gonna really know why it bothers me when they won't do what I say, because I'm still from the mindset that wants to own something. I, see them as a thing. I'm objectifying my partner. And so until I'm illuminated to the fact that that person is sacred and how they got to their, their life story and who they are and what they are is sacred and shared with me, then I can appreciate the time we spend together. So I always tell my son, you know, I say, you know, you don't own, you don't ever own anybody. You're like, I don't own mom. Like we don't own each other. Like that's, you know, one of the first things we took out of our words was let. It was one of the first words we took out. We were freshly married. She was on the phone with her girlfriends and she was like, oh, hold on, let me, let me see if he'll let me go. You know, just casual. She wouldn't even mean it like that. But she said it, you know, like, well, let me see if he'll let me. And I was like, hold on, let's just, I know you didn't mean it that way, but let's just talk words. We don't have let. We don't do let. I don't, you're a grown, you're a grown person. <laughs> I mean, we check in with each other because, you know, I want to use the car or whatever. And like we, we, we have a respect for each other. So we do that. But one person don't own the other person. So there's no allowing. Right. So we took that out of our out of our, our words. Right. And so our quality time was better, et cetera. And so. Let me see. Oh, my gosh. Why are you saying that? We talk too much. You're so crazy. She's in the comments. Oh, great. Anyway, uh, let me see if anybody had anything here before it gets on. We only have 10 minutes left, but. Um, oh, good, Naomi. Awesome. Um, as always, you can always DM if you have questions or whatever. Um, you don't want to put in the comments. Um, but the overall goal here, you know, in, in summation was just that it's possible to have great things, to have, uh, you're worthy of having somebody who will celebrate you. Um, you're worthy to have somebody who will protect and to not, and to pray with an A, not an E. Um, and you don't have to settle. Um, I wrote something for someone the other day. I didn't put it on her Facebook 
it's one of the students that we work with yet yeah, but i had uh but i thought it it, it, it applied to uh to several people and that was that uh i would like to also you know, put this out there for someone here i think might need to hear this because i i told her that uh some she put a post on or something about someday somebody would recognize her qualities or whatever and this goes out to those that feel that same way that i was saying I, some might even be intimidated that when you got it put together there's certain people that might feel like, oh, dang, I don't know if I can step to that person because they got it together. She she got a job and she got a, I, he got his stuff together. But I was just telling them, I was telling that person, I, you know, what I wanted to share was do me a favor, though. Don't ever bottle up, cap, dumb down or limit your awesomeness for anyone. Have the patience to wait until someone is secure enough, strong enough but also humble enough to run with you, matching your awesomeness step for step, no matter how long it takes, patience is the virtue. And so forever that's for, I feel like that was, that was brought to me right now for somebody that, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a sprint, you know, it's not a, uh, something that has to be like, oh my gosh, if I don't, you know, get this together soon, it's going to be, you know, what in the world? It's a journey, the process and, what I fell in love with was the process. And then what came out of that was friends. And one of those friends became a best friend. And that best friend became family. And that family turned into our unit. We're not perfect. And we fight and argue and shake our heads around or whatever you want to say and roll our eyes and be done with each other, whatever, you know, in, the, in a healthy way. But, we, but that's just it, in a healthy way. We fight fair. We we prefer each other and we try to model the um, spiritual has the highest say. That's what we chase. So we try to do. Oh my gosh, I forgot I had this on this slideshow. So that's first, well, that's not our first kiss, but that was when we had our, oh, I forgot to tell you all that, man. So because I was on that path that I was on, again, this is not a don't kiss workshop. My wife and I kissed for the first time at the altar. That was our first kiss. We kissed plenty of people separately, trust me, but that was our first kiss. I, ha I was on that path for a few years. I was saying, I'm not gonna have sex till I get married. I said, I'm not gonna kiss till I get married. And there was my best friend. She got to see me through that process. She knew that I wasn't kissing nobody. And we got to see our character instead of um, that's what happens a lot is intimacy. And then we try to force commitment. We jump out and become intimate. And then we try to force them. Where are you going? Where are you going? Cause we feel vulnerable. We feel violated. We feel we now, I, now I need to compensate. But if you're committed first, then the intimacy can happen in its proper time. And so, yeah, then these are old picks. I have to put some new picks up. I didn't even know I had these picks on here. Um, the last Jedi. Dang, that's a whole school. There we are. The unit, right? So it's like, and during this pandemic, it's been really cool to know that, you know, my life went through such a, I mean, um, I don't even have the terminology to say how to quantify the disruption that my life went through with the pandemic when I was flying, I probably do 200 events a year. And March will be the first time in 25 years that I won't have a flight in one full year. First time I haven't flown in a year. I mean, crazy, right? And so we've been doing life together in a different pace than we have for 19 years. And, and it's been awesome. And I mean, obviously, you know, we're good with me getting back out there and stuff, but I was appreciative of the groundwork we laid early on because we're reaping the fruit of that now. And that's possible, not just for us, that's possible for anybody who's willing to do the self work and the self healing step towards it. You'll attract healing, you'll attract. I'll be honest with you, had I met her earlier, I wouldn't have attracted her because she wouldn't even have seen me. 
because I was stepping the, the wrong direction. And those kind of people aren't attracted to that. They I had to step a certain direction. And then I was attractive to people in that kind of mind space, right? 4.3 GPA, 1533 on the SAT, you know, one of smart folks, you know, uh, above my pay grade, so to speak, right? So I attracted that because I was stepping towards self learning, self bettering, self healing. And as you step towards that, you attract that in other people and you attract the, the right kind of folks around you for your journey. Hope this was helpful for some. Oh, snap, is it still, oh, I took it off, is it still on there? See if there's any last little comments here in the section. I appreciate your guys' time. Uh, let it go, bro. So, all right, hey man, I appreciate your guys' appreciation here in the comment section. Um, this will be, on uh, on demand, so to speak, for people to rewatch later. And as always, if you guys have any questions or whatever, you guys can. Well, that was for uh, anybody. I'm glad I did that. That was for if anybody is in a in a toxic relationship and they need a resource, um, you need to call somebody. You need to develop an exit strategy. It's a number. Um, more important to connect it with me. If you're in one of those situations and you need a way out, we'll do one of these later and we'll talk about some of those red flags. We'll do a red flag show where you can kind of tell, you know, like, ooh, I should have seen that. How come I didn't see that? We'll do some red flag shows. But um, if you're in one of those situations, it's time to develop your exit strategy. You are worth having great things. You're worth it. And this is how you can get a hold of me. Hope to see you out there in cyber world. And I appreciate Native Wellness Noise Foundation for letting me take over your broadcast. And we shall see you when we see you. God bless. I'll figure it out. I'll end it at some point.